Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar in the series related to our project exploring the admissibility of individual criminal cases from Ukraine before the International Criminal Court. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Agata Klechkowska, from one of our project partners, the Institute of Law Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences. So in parallel with events in Crimea dating back to 2014, which we have discussed in uh, the previous webinar, anti-government protests took place in eastern regions of uh, Ukraine and were followed by anti-terrorist operations deployed by the Ukrainian government. Um, in April, the control over the provinces in Donetsk and Luhansk was lost and full combat alert resulted in the conscription to the armed forces of uh, Ukraine. At the same time, representatives of the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic announced independence. The hostilities recorded the highest number of casualties prior to the 2015 Minsk II uh, agreement. However, the hostilities of uh, various um, intensity are still ongoing. And this is the scope of our today's uh, discussion. I'm happy that for today, uh, speakers who can uh, surely comment on the situation in Eastern Ukraine from various perspectives have accepted our invitation. Uh, we are joined by Stefan Siegler, former head of reporting in the OSC hub in Donbas. Stefan has over 20 years of experience in humanitarian action in Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, Palestine, the Balkans, to name a few. And he currently works as a humanitarian trainer, lecturer, and independent film producer. And he's also well known for the production of a film called Broken, a Palestinian journey to international law. Stefan is also one of the patrons of um, our global advocacy program aiming to strengthen the legal framework on the human right to peace. We are also joined by Varvara Pachomenko, who has been working in armed conflict zones since 2006. Varvara has served as the Genevia Calls Head of Mission in Ukraine, engaging armed groups in dialogue to increase their respect for humanitarian law and the protection of civilians. Varvara has also worked in Donbas in her capacity of early recovery advisor to UNDP Ukraine and has also served in various other positions focusing on conflicts in Chechnya or Georgia. I also welcome among us the deputy head of the Department for uh, Supervision in Criminal Proceedings for uh, Crimes Committed in, con in the Conditions of Armed Conflict at the Prosecutor General's Office of Ukraine. But as I see, she's presently not here, so we will give it a minute or two for her. Uh, nevertheless, I um, also, yeah. Stitlop, I didn't know if you noticed, but um, uh, Zara was writing that she was raising her hand and as she was asking whether she is visible. So perhaps this is some technical problem. Mm, let me see. I see her now. Uh, she has been promoted to a panelist, so she should be able to join us. Let me try again. There she is, yeah, because she should have a speaker uh, invitation, so she might not need to uh, be promoted like this, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, we should be all fine now. Hello. Hello. Sorry, sorry. I did it. <laughs> A technical issue. Um, no problem, no problem at all. Uh, good evening, Zara. So I also welcome you among us. Uh, so once again, Zara uh, Kozlieva is the deputy head of the Department for Supervision in Criminal Proceedings for Crimes Committed in the Conditions of Armed Conflict at the Prosecutor General's Office of uh, Ukraine, where she focuses in her position on the investigation of war crimes and crimes against uh, humanity in the occupied territories. 
Uh, and last but not least, I welcome Konstantin Karaman, the first deputy head of the Luhansk Regional Prosecutor's Office. Konstantin is responsible for the organization of the work of the Department of Supervision in criminal proceedings for crimes committed in the conditions of armed conflict, as well as for international legal cooperation. Just this year, following his initiative, two communications were sent to the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC. Uh, we will first start with the interventions of uh, our speakers, with uh, each one having up to 15 minutes before we proceed with questions. Uh, so the audience is invited to leave the questions in the Q&A chat box in Zoom. And since we are live on Facebook, we'll be collecting questions also there. Uh, and please specify to whom your question is uh, addressed. Uh, I think it is about time to start, so I pass the floor to our first speaker, Stefan Ziegler, please. Not used to doing this when I teach, I never have to do this. Uh, well, good evening and thank you very much, uh, Rasislav, for your introduction. I think I have to pass as your first speaker. I was not aware that you wanted a 15 minute talk from me. So I will have to uh, pass that to my colleagues and uh, I'll come up with a few notes at the end if that's okay, yeah? All right, so I think we can proceed with Varvara then and we will then return to your notes at the end. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I was prepared to talk a bit more about engaging our armed groups on the issue, uh, topics of uh, war crimes and uh, other violations of international humanitarian law. But maybe I have to say now a few words about what we are dealing with in terms of what kind of uh, violations we are most, mostly facing in um, armed conflicts. Uh, because I saw Stefan would talk about this. <laughs> so I maybe just uh, dedicate a few minutes to this. Uh, as you already uh, explained, uh, most of the hostilities, most active hostilities uh, actually were happening in 2014 and 2015, uh, including uh, following the second Minsk agreement, uh, so the battle for Ilovaisk and uh, later on um, fighting uh, in the area of uh, Gorlevka and Dibaltseva and all over there. And uh, most of the victims of this conflict, both military and civilians, uh, probably two thirds of the victims happened prior to that time. So we, maybe up to the middle of, uh, mid of 2015. Since then, uh, we see a, a constant decline on the, on the number of victims. Uh, according to OSC uh, monitoring and according to the monitor, monitoring of um, uh, UN human rights uh, mission. Uh, and the nature of hostilities quite, changed quite a lot. If initially that was a, a would say, full-scale war, including aviation, including all, all multiple rocket launcher systems, and uh, both sides uh, were moving back and forth in the territory almost up from the Russian border up to the uh, Kharkiv region and back. Uh, so since 2015, especially 2016, we have more or less stabilized front line where uh, sides would only uh, continue kind of moving closer to each other uh, in so-called gray zone. And uh, in the last couple of years, we basically can already talk about the trenches war, uh, where one military group, one army facing another uh, big military group on another side, and uh, with the only slightest moves on the ground, it could be always, I don't know, a few dozens of meters or hundreds of meters when a few sides managed to, uh, one on another side managed, managed to pros, uh, to progress uh, on the ground. Uh, but, uh, and we have less of uh, uh, artillery shelling now, but we have more of uh, other types of uh, the, the com com combative hostilities, conductive hostilities changed a bit. So 
if initially the most of the victims, as I said, were victims of a artillery shell, and now it would be uh, victims of the mines, uh, especially among civilians. Uh, if um, most of the military suffered from mines in 2015, 2016, when they were uh, moving uh, closer to each other on the highly uh, con mine contaminated area. Since then, there's, as I said, much less movement on the military side and probably they already know better and uh, map the area much better and understand where to go and where not to. Uh, while civilians who uh, recently uh, kind of understand that the situation is going to stay like it is and become more active uh, in their day-to-day -day activities along the front line, including agricultural activities, they are more and more often become victims of a, a minor incident. It could be mines, it could be unexploded remains of war. Uh, and um, so for now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, according to the assessment of OEC or UN, up to from one half to up to two thirds of the uh, civilian victims are uh, suffering from the mine incidents. Uh, another type of modern, let's say, uh, military activity is um, uh, just small arm shootings and uh, mortars, uh, which led to much less victims among civilians, yet sometimes uh, they uh, become an accidental victims as well. I would say, according to assessment and probably what I could see on the ground, very often it's a collateral damage. They become a collateral damage uh, in uh, those uh, clashes and maybe up to 10% of all victims, I count as the victims as those who've been uh, killed and those who've been uh, injured. Uh, those are, they are victims of a, a small arm uh, incidents and uh, mortar, sh mortar shooting. Um, recently we see more and more cases of a, uh, drone uses uh, and, and both sides, and now especially the Ukrainian side, getting more and more of uh, the use of a professional uh, armed drones. Uh, if initially there were much more, um, let's say, self-made uh, drones or using the civilian drones as a, uh, for the military purposes, uh, they probably, and they, they are much more precise in terms of the bombing than um, artillery, uh, but still there have been a few incidents reported on the victims among uh, civilians from uh, use of, uh, of drones as well. Uh, what, apart from those, the mine issues and uh, mine victims, civilians suffer the most is probably uh, access to services, mostly access to healthcare and access to education. Uh, we can see that the hundreds of uh, schools along the front line, and we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians living along the front line, especially in Donetsk area, uh, where uh, most of the big cities uh, position uh, in, along the front line, such as Donetsk, Horlivka, Avdivka, Yesenovate. Uh, so we, uh, we can talk about the hundreds of schools which have been uh, is it directly targeted or become a collateral damage over the last years uh, since the beginning of the conflict? Uh, very often the situation is that um, military groups on the both sides were positioned inside the uh, schools or other educational facilities uh, or positioned very in a dangerously close proximity, which led to the fact that the schools been uh, targeted by the opposite side. Uh, in terms of access to uh, healthcare, uh, especially, obviously, the issue of uh, that people are limited in the freedom of movement across the uh, front line and cannot go to hospitals, doctors they used to go before, either on the uh, go to the side controlled by the non government controlled territory or other way around. There is an issue of people living uh, just along the front line. Uh, in those smaller uh, towns and villages where um, often they cannot in time get a, a urgent medical assistance. Uh, 
uh, talking to the residents of those villages and to uh, healthcare uh, providers in the region, I uh, could see that uh, quite often the um, ambulances would hesitate to go to the certain areas because of the uh, threats they uh, could be exposed there to. Uh, it's either they could be targeted directly, and that's what I heard, uh, that many prefer not to even uh, mark their uh, ambulances or cars with uh, distinctive emblems, like Red Cross, for example, to not be targeted, uh, or um, they just, in general, consider this is too dangerous to go. Um, Obviously, it is a uh, uh, damage to the um, infrastructure, such as water infrastructure and gas. Uh, it's another very important kind of complaint from the uh, residents of living along the front line. Very often, the uh, shelling and the uh, active hostilities uh, they lead to the fact that uh, the infrastructure being damaged, and in certain areas, it's permanently damaged, uh, and people don't have an access to. Um, to the gas or, or even water for already a very long time. Um, just maybe stopping on this in terms of a general explanation of the situation, I would want to say a few words about the work I used to do. Uh, I know that a colleague from the prosecutor office is gonna uh, talk a lot about very important issue as investigation and the prosecution of the crimes which been, have been already committed. Uh, what I, in my previous position, uh, working with uh, Geneva Call, uh, tried to work, it's more prevention job. Uh, so we tried to engage um, fighting uh, parties uh, into dialogue and uh, provide them uh, certain trainings on uh, international humanitarian law and a way to fight respecting civilians and maybe uh, having a better protection for the fighters themselves. Um, and uh, how to fight with uh, not only just it's not only about respecting civilians, but also fulfilling Ukrainian uh, government obligations or uh, that international humanitarian common law obligations. Um, we uh, found out that very often uh, fighters on the ground were just not aware of such uh, rules at all, rules of international humanitarian law. And in most of the cases, I could say they, there was no specific in many, especially in recent years, specific violations that they would like to go and kill as many civilians as possible. No, that what very often would be a, a cases of collateral damage, or they would not properly plan at all uh, and would not consider how to uh, run their operation to minimize uh, the potential damage among civilians and sometimes their own fighters. So the issues we uh, would engage them on, um, it's, it's a general scope of uh, uh, conduct of hostilities, but uh, those uh, few I mentioned uh, specifically, so the uh, mind threat, uh, the uh, access to education, the protection of civilian infrastructure, uh, protection of healthcare and access to the healthcare. Uh, how uh, how that was done? Uh, that was a way to that you will first engage them in a dialogue to talk uh, and see whether they are committed in general to the fact that they have to follow uh, certain certain norms and certain rules. Uh, and as I said, very often we found that they do share and in principle they agree with all those uh, ideas and commitments, uh, but were not aware they they exist. They exist, exist as, a, as a law, as a, something on paper. And quite often during our trainings, people would see it and say, I was trying to come up with some sort of rules for myself or for my, for my unit, how to fight. Uh, and so thank you so much for sharing that this, is, this already exists. Uh, we started this engagement back in uh, 2017 uh, and uh, in the more, um, let's say, uh, systematic way in 2018. And uh, 
found out that there was a, a very kind of good response to this, uh, especially once the units understood that we come there with this idea of training them on, on the prevention issues, uh, not just to uh, make them but they responsible for what have already been committed, but to uh, help them to improve their own capacity, to uh, explain that that being a uh, disciplined uh, unit, knowing the rules of war, uh, help your own unit, help to improve morale, helps to uh, improve relations with the civilians. And relations with the civilians was another very important topic which came up. And we found that it's uh, another kind of um, weak point. Uh, and so it has kind of maybe two, two issues. It's first the coordination between various uh, security agencies, military agencies on the ground. So for instance, it could be the units of a uh, uh, Minister of Defense or a Minister of Interior which are on the ground and could be positioned in different areas uh, or in the same one, but not always uh, properly communicating with each other. Or it's uh, relations between those uh, units and uh, local civilians. Uh, obviously, um, uh, CIMIC units, uh, civil military cooperation units in, uh, are, uh, in the army and uh, in the Ministry of uh, Interior, which they, where they were later established as well, helped us this a lot. Uh, but sometimes what we also tried to do and help them to, to invite to the joint meetings, and we very often invited a, a representative of the prosecutor of, uh, office on the ground to such meetings between uh, local communities uh, along the front line. And, um, um, and different uh, various security agencies. So quite often we found out that they, it was just a lack of dialogue, a lack of understanding what's, what the pro where the problem comes from. So for, for instance, it's an, maybe an issue of a positioning of certain uh, security objects uh, too close to certain civilian uh, infrastructure, uh, which could be discussed and could be uh, agreed upon or the access uh, to, to the village or access to uh, healthcare. Uh, and uh, while training, uh, we try to, as much as possible, take the very specific um, situations which uh, units could uh, face uh, in their daily life and uh, consider how they can improve their, uh, their uh, performance, but at the same time, uh, minimize the risks uh, for local civilians. Uh, probably the most problematic topic to discuss was the issue of mines. And uh, very, very few were aware that Ukraine is a, a signature to Ottawa Convention, which is banning, uh, banning anti-personal mines. And even the uh, military, oh, sorry, even the manufactured uh, anti-personal mines uh, rarely now would be used uh, on the ground. Self-made anti-personal mines is still a big problem. For example, just a grenade on the street attached somewhere. Uh, very often uh, security uh, services, militaries see, see mines as a main tool to protect themselves and uh, don't estimate so much, don't assess so much the damage it can uh, cause on the local communities, and even especially the long-term uh, uh, negative, have a long-term negative effect. Uh, so when they hear the, uh, then those numbers and assessments that Ukraine is uh, one of the most mine contaminated area in the world, Eastern Ukraine, they get very much surprised uh, and, so it's more about, uh, as I said before, more, more about discussing with them how they can plan their daily operations, how they can plan their protections, why they would need to have a better relations with the local population, that would, this would help them to uh, increase their protection without, for example, using mines or other tools which can damage them. I would stop here.
Thank you so much. It was such an informative and interesting speech and there's so many questions to ask and uh, thank you very much for that. So now please let me pass the floor to Zara. Uh, good evening for all again. Uh, thank you for invitation and thank you for this opportunity. And I will not uh, talk about our problem. I will try to explain our position uh, of uh, this fear in the measures of function of persecutor as a government body. I think some of this and uh, I'll try to give uh, uh, as, uh, as, it, as it possible in this time, general uh, information, uh, how I can. And so I, I want uh, to begin from that, um, say that, as you know, Ukrainian has been a state uh, of international armed conflict for uh, eight years. And this has led to the fact that 7% uh, of our country is occupied and according to only official uh, statistics alone, 1,473,650 uh, people are currently internally displaced persons from the temporarily occupied and uncontrolled territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions and the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. In addition, tens of thousands of people have been victims of serious violations of international humanitarian law and uh, gross human rights violations. Such violations are defined as a war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, and uh, Ukraine is obliged uh, to investigate them both in accordance with national law and accordance with our international legal obligations, as said uh, before uh, another speaker. In order to fulfill this obligation, a specialized, uh, a specialized uh, department uh, for the investigation of crimes during the armed conflict has been established in the Prosecutor General's Office, which I represent, as well as special units in the Donetsk and Lugansk Regional Prosecutor's Office and the Prosecutor's Office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Uh, it was relocated to Kyiv in uh, 2014. To date, more than uh, 30,000 criminal offenses related to the armed conflict have been registered in Ukraine, in which the procedural guidance is provided by the Prosecutor's Office of Ukraine. In addition, mechanism to the national justice system to ensure prosecution for international crimes in the is the International Criminal Court, which, uh, with which we cooperate closely. The main types of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed both in the occupied Crimea and in eastern of Ukraine are tortures, murders, uh, as you may be knowing, forced uh, disappearances, caution to join the armed forces of uh, an enemy state, forcible transfers and illegal deportations, misappropriation and destruction of both private uh, a private property and national property of Ukraine, including uh, cultural heritage sites, as well as uh, shelling of civilian infrastructure and uh, many, many others. In addition, in the context of armed conflict in Ukraine, a number of other categories of crimes are committed. These uh, include crimes against the foundations of national security, crimes against public safety, crimes in the field Zara, did we uh, ask just... very much? Also, in uh, for example, trainings for our uh, prosecutors and uh, investigators uh, in the spheres of international humanitarian law and international criminal law, because really uh, before 29, uh, 2014, yeah, uh, our prosecutor office and uh, investigators uh, bodies 
uh, didn't have practice in investigation of this type of crimes. And uh, so for now, uh, we have um, better situation when we have uh, not bad knowledge, uh, fundamental knowledge and knowledge about different type of crimes of war crimes. And uh, so for today, um, for, for our opinion, we have uh, much progress in investigation of these crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, it is very interesting. So uh, now please uh, let me pass the floor to Mr. Konstantin Karaman. You have 15 minutes. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, currently, the Lugansk uh, Regional Prosecutor's Office provides procedural guidance in uh, 8,733 uh, criminal cases uh, committed in the context of the armed conflict. Investigation of crimes committed in the armed conflict is uh, completed uh, by the fact that investigators and prosecutors do not have access to the territory where the crime was committed. Uh, witnesses living in the occupied territories refuse to rectify because they fear for their lives. lives. In the 94 cases uh, of violations of the laws and customs of war, Article uh, 438 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine, 18 persons were reported as suspects, five indictments were sent to court, and seven, uh, and seven uh, criminal uh, procedures were suspended in connection with the search for suspects. The courts uh, passed two verdicts under Article 438 of the Criminal Court of Ukraine against uh, 16 people. The first verdict uh, concerned the case of four members of the so-called uh, Kozak's National Guard of the Great Army of the Don Platov, of the Occupation Administration of the Russian Federation in the Lugansk region for violating the laws and customs of uh, war, for kidnapping people, forcing them to perform work on the construction of checkpoints. The militants were sentenced to 10 years in prison. According to the results of the appellate uh, review, the sentence uh, was upheld. It has gained uh, legal force. Uh, the court's decision is currently being ch challenged by the defense in the Supreme Court. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so now can we ask Stefan for some remarks, given what have been said and or what not have been said? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Give me a few extra minutes, okay? Um, I think, first of all, uh, it's been a long time since I was in Eastern Ukraine um donbass um which is 19 uh, 2015 uh, i was there for four months um, my reflections are the following um i was um i was employed with osc as a uh, reporting officer in donetsk which covered half of the um the territories and it was at the height i think of combat at least during the 2014-2015 uh, period, according also to what uh, Barbara says, and, and her, her figures speak a great deal. I think also in terms of the international community's intervention, at least so we hope. Um, it was a time when um, I think none of us here present were um, 
fully um, equipped to do our work. And um, please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, it was still a very young conflict. It was an odd conflict, which it still is, uh, at, at least from my perspective as a, an international humanitarian. Uh, odd because there are very unclear um, lines of demarcation, and I'm not talking about the lines of demarcation on the ground. It's not a geographic uh, uh, term that I'm using, but who is who? Um, who is who? Uh, you know what the uh, the U at that time what constitutes the Ukrainian army wasn't very clear um, because there were so many volunteers. Now that these volunteers were in train, that doesn't surprise anybody. Um, the volunteers uh, were driven by whatever motivations they were. They were certainly not, uh, they were not well integrated in a command structure. And um, please correct me, uh, um, uh, Konstantin, if I'm wrong, but, but I thought it was also probably very, very much the same on the other side with, um, um, you know, um, personnel belonging to armed forces, not quite clear which armed forces they were either from or what they were doing. Uh, this is just an observation because as a humanitarian, it makes you know, uh, the ground very muddy, meaning how do you operate in, a, uh, in an environment where, as Varvar was saying, you know, you'd like to train people but you can only train people if a you know where they are and who they are and if the major players are not quite sure who they are themselves um like you know who becomes your beneficiary who is a civilian uh in, for that matter uh it's very unclear because uh in the old days it was a a uniform and, and some kind of a a mark on the un uniform that would tell you where you belong to but if you're you know, half civilian, you do all sorts of funny things, sorry to say, but that, that was my impression at the time. Um, uh, it became, uh, I think, as a humanitarian, I'm not talking for the OSC, not, not as of yet, um, but as a humanitarian, simply having my eyes open uh, was, um, I thought it was a difficult, uh, a difficult place uh, to be, uh, to work in, um, because you would like to, to believe that as a humanitarian, you do good. I mean, at least if you believe in the Geneva Conventions and so on, uh, and, and other uh, law texts, which I'm not sure to what degree that was actually something that me and some of my colleagues uh, believed we were doing, um, because um, there was a lot of interference also from uh, so-called oligarchs who, um, at that time, they did some, you know, humanitarian work, which to me as a humanitarian didn't quite look as humanitarian, uh, especially giving away, you know, phone cards and stuff like that, unless these are projects that pass me by in other contexts. But but this was a, and I don't know to what degree it still is, huh? because I, I, as I said, I've been away for many years now, but I think there's a legacy to that. And the legacy is that, Although we may have moved on, and thanks to God there are less civilians killed, uh, okay, maybe not by mines, which is anyway a, a, a very, um, uh, you know, a, a disgusting old um, um, uh, type of warfare. Um, but I wondered when I left uh, uh, Ukraine about four and a half months later, um, whether we had actually fulfilled the humanitarian mission. And that leads me on to talking about the OSC. <clears throat> um, as far as I remember, or as far as I can tell, OSC never had a mandate for in, in conflict, um, um, you know, uh, um, in conflict um, uh, um, humanitarian um, projects or programs. Um, it comes out of a post conflict. Um, uh, situation in the Balkans. So uh, it, it appears that OSCE was there present just because there were elections and that didn't go well. And, and so they were the natural kind of uh, candidate to stay. Um, I have to say, 
years later and I'm no longer uh, employed, at least not directly employed by the OSC, so I can say what I'm saying. I'm not sure it was the best organization placed to have such a huge, um, uh, such a huge presence. I remember when we were there, they asked for another 500 um, potential um, humanitarians or CIMIC people to join uh, the mission uh, just in like in in and around Donetsk. Uh, and when you look at the the amount of job advertisements in the humanitarian section uh, of any you know newspapers, online uh, uh, search engines, and so on, you will not find five hundred um, humanitarians just like that. So I think that was an overkill with humanitarian presence because they again should have had training. Now we got security training, all of us, that's uh, for sure. But I don't think most of the, the new people that were hired have any real notion of what humanitarianism is about, unless USC didn't actually see itself as a humanitarian player. And that I can't answer you because this is not up to me. This is to the, uh, the people that have uh, um, uh, invested heavily in that mission. Uh, I think, of course, there's positive sides and the very good side is that there was presence. We call that in our jargon, uh, protective presence when humanitarians are there to um, to even if they're just present, if they do nothing at all, but if people can come out of their houses, uh, you know, most likely they will not be shelled while there is some kind of a, a humanitarian organization doing some kind of, of um, 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 assistance or, 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 or projects. So I think that in that sense, we were probably doing a really good job because we were present in a lot of places. But beyond that, uh, I remember the discussions that the OSC had, uh, or even lacked of discussions they should have had, um, when we moved from more protective work to assistance work. And I, I, I felt, um, well, I think the UN is much better placed in places like this to actually deliver good, goods to the people. But it, everything had to be done also by the OSC. And, and I think uh, I would love to hear, obviously, what Werber has to say. She was there after, or just after I uh, I left, uh, to see, um, you know, how helpful is that? I mean, if, if an a agency, you know, starts doing things, uh, you know, that they've never done in the, in the past, uh, not on that scale. So I'm my reflections on all of this is I think um, that I I turned probably. Um, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't say cynical, but I certainly am very uh, critical of that type of heavy uh, institutionalized human humanitarianism um, of quantity of people, putting them in the middle of harm's way. When I was there, the shelling was from both sides, and we literally lived in a hotel that was right under where the shells fell down from the sky. Well, you know, and you ask yourself, is that you know, is that really uh, is that really what we should have done? We had um, I can't remember, but way more than two hundred people in the same hotel. Um, I wouldn't have taken very much to put two hundred people at harm's in harm's way, just because an organization decides we have to be present. Um, I believe, and this is not cynical. This is really a belief that I have that OSC may have been slightly uh, led misled by its own structure, because its own structure is not run by people that are protective or assistance humanitarians that, that have feel experience. It is run by, by diplomats in Vienna. And, and, you know, and, and so you know, that's kind of what you get. I hope, and I believe it has improved. Um, but these are kind of my, my re recollections from that, from that time, um, which I really believe still have a bearing on, on, on certain things some of those colleagues they're still there five years later i'm not sure what goods to the world they are uh, they are very much uh, uh, shell-shocked uh, for, for years um, it's not an environment where anybody should should spend more than maybe a year um, uh, working unless they have a really good system of, of um, you know of going home for a while and getting uh, uh, you know um, 
respite and, and, and what have you. Um, so, so there you go. Um, that's a little bit my, my side. I, I, I do not want to get into the legal side. I, uh, I said, the rest is left. This is not my background. Uh, the only thing I can say is that, and thanks for, for, um, for mentioning that, my film's name is, is um, broken, a blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, uh, broken uh, uh, is about the um, mistrust of civilians vis-a-vis -vis international law. And certainly um, the Donbass is not making a difference to any other place on, on earth where people feel that international law has left them alone for whatever reasons. And I think training alone may not be the only, um, the only way out. So, okay, <laughs> that's my two pence worth, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to hear from the practical side what was going on uh, in the field. So it was uh, very informative. Uh, so uh, we open a Q&A session. So uh, we welcome any questions to any of our panelists. And uh, perhaps waiting for these questions, um, I will start uh, with asking a few because um, I think that uh, what you said was so interesting and you have such a great background and experience that uh, it's, it would be uh, really uh, such a shame not to, not to use it and to ask you about some uh, more details and your thoughts on uh, some of the developments. So maybe I will start with the question to Varvara. So uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the line between both sides is uh, more or less stabilized right now, and they are moving only within this gray zone. So what do you think is the future of the conflict then? What may happen next? What may be the further developments? So how do you see the future of the conflict given your, your experience? Uh, my question uh, to Nazera is, um, do you cooperate with the ICC? Do you pass on any information about the, uh, about the uh, committed crimes to the ICC? We know that we are now waiting for the pre-trial chamber to, uh, to, to, to uh, give its decision, but um, does it change anything? Do you still, do you have any uh, communication with the court? And my question to Stefan is, um, you mentioned a lot of difficulties uh, connected with the um, bringing of humanitarian assistance. And uh, you also uh, give your opinion on many uh, of the um, uh, wrongful decisions concerning the uh, presence and way of delivering this humanitarian assistance. So how do you think would be the best way uh, to bring humanitarian assistance to conflicts like the one in Donbas, in Ukraine. Uh, how would you see it as an experienced humanitarian? Uh, what would be the most beneficial both for the civilians, uh, for people on the ground, and uh, both given, the, of course, the security uh, of the uh, humanitarians who are there to help? So uh, thank you for that. So maybe we'll start with Barbara. Thank you very much for the question, Agatha. Uh, future of the conflict, well, I can, can try to be a fortune tailor, but um, definitely none of us, I'm sure, can't predict now what's going to happen. But just a few thoughts uh, on how it might develop. Uh, just looking at the situation on the ground, it's not 2014 anymore. Uh, we have, as uh, Stefan was uh, telling how it looked on the ground back in 2015, 2014, where you would have a dispersed groups where you could rarely, some well, often not understand whom they belong to, uh, how do they identify themselves, whether they're trained or not trained. It's not the case anymore. Even uh, on both sides, uh, they, uh, Forces are highly structured. Structurized, uh, the subordination is quite high as well, and uh, they understand whom they respond to. Even the few groups uh, which 
remain, for, for instance, on the Ukrainian side, non-state groups, which are still present on the front line uh, and not formally incorporated in the uh, nasal security structures. All those who used to be uh, independent, like volunteer battalions, but then have to be formally incorporated, for instance, the Azov Battalion, which is now a part of the Ministry of Interior. Uh, they have a certain degree of independence in maybe on tactical level, but if we talk about the strict strategy, they are pretty well coordinate their actions with uh, everybody above them. So I can tell the same about the other side. It's not 2015, it's not 2016, even not 2017. So you can see how the, uh, the uh, non-state groups on the uh, non-government controlled territory and the territory controlled by uh, self-proclaimed DNR and LNR, they are also now turned almost into the armies. And uh, they, are, they also dig very deep, let's say. So they build trenches, they build anti-tank uh, facilities, they have uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, missiles. So if any side now decides to proceed with their attack, what I can tell for sure, that's gonna lead to a lot of blood, probably much more than we've seen before. So both sides are ready to fight. And it's gonna lead not just to the blood in among the uh, fighting parties, and fighting groups, but civilians as well. Most of the civilians who had somewhere to go, they already left the place on the boss side. They already fled. Kiev, Russia, Canada, whatever. Uh, those who left, they have nowhere to go. They got used to the fact that there is a war. When uh, I remember back in 2016, when the uh, hostilities were still quite active, uh, and when you would talk to the civilians on the ground, UNDP did the research back then, what bothers them the most, they would name first not the uh, mines, not the shelling, but lack of job, uh, lack of uh, access to like a proper um, source of, or sources of income and all of this. So is they normalized their life there. I remember being in, uh, in Donetsk in um, the beginning of 2017 when there was a hostilities over Avdivka started, when the people in Avdivka had been shelled and there was a shelling going back to Donetsk. And it was a shock for many residents there. Those who evacuated for 2015, 2015 hostilities, they all got back. So they all are there. So if now there's uh, uh, the proper, let's say, hostilities will start over again, and any sides decides to move, it's going to lead to the thousands of, uh, of victims on both sides. That we can tell for sure. And I'm sure, just 100% sure, that all sides understand this. And that's probably what keeps them from, from a uh, significant move, military, uh, military move, let's say. Uh, talking about uh, any peace deal, we've seen the several attempts of the peace deal in the recent years. Yes, it was uh, 2016, 2017, there were negotiations. Then everybody expected with that uh, Zelensky coming in power, there is another, uh, was another wave of negotiations, which brings some, some fruits, some, um, something the exchange of prisoners, the um, re reconstruction of a bridge in Stanitsa Luhanska, which really helped people, but then we got into the COVID and actually all movements stopped there. Uh, and all those small issues, even the disengagement on the front line, when it started, it actually helped the people living in those small areas, but it was such a small areas, two kilometers by two kilometers in the three spots along the front line. And it hasn't happened anywhere since then, almost in practice, because of the lack of trust to, uh, between the sides. So all that hope which existed in 2019 was a new team, it disappeared. Now we can see the uh, quite hus hostile uh, statements from Moscow toward Ukraine uh, and the uh, Ukrainian leadership. So 
we, the best we can hope now that it's going to be some uh, humanitarian context going to exist. There is still going to be exchange of prisoners, maybe, that people who need uh, urgent medical assistance would get uh, permission to cross the line, uh, maybe bring some humanitarian uh, assistance into the region. But in terms of where could it lead the major breakthrough, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. So I'm afraid it can be stay as it is now as a, and it's not, I don't think it's going to turn into something what's like South Ossetia or Transnistria because the front line goes just along the uh, edges of the big cities next to the strategically important uh, facilities for both sides. So both sides can keep shelling a bit, little bit to keep the tens, uh, tenses, to keep the, uh, each side in tonus, because every time you stop shelling, it means the other side getting better fortified and has a better positions to uh, to attack next time. So they don't let it happen. So what I can see now, it's going to stay how it is. With the uh, uh, escalations keep going sometimes, uh, hopefully not turning into the full scale war. But we cannot exclude the full scale war. Even as I said, both sides, I believe. Uh, understand what would be the price for full-scale war. We cannot guarantee that they decide, okay, we're ready to pay the price. So. Thank you very much. It's, it's a very concerning perspective. Nevertheless, I, I agree with you that uh, the conflict will perhaps stay as it is for, for a long time uh, farther. Um, so, uh, Zara, could we ask? Yeah, thank you for a question. Uh, but for the first, uh, I am in. Uh, I'm a little excited from what I heard now, and the very important questions. Uh, not only it's not a, uh, only about uh, uh, our um, work because I'm from Crimea, and so it's very important for me as a person, not only as a persecutor. And what about your question? Um, uh, yes, of course, we cooperate with International Criminal Court for first uh, because of uh, many uh, people um, stay uh, on occupied territories and we don't have uh, access to these territories and so it's uh, a little difficult for our criminal proceeding, but we have a, a mechanism of uh, um, in absentia, you know, and we use it also. Uh, but uh, when we told uh, about uh, um, about a real patient uh, of uh, people who are guilty on these crimes, uh, we know that some people also have a, a diplomatic or functional uh, Im Im immunity, yeah, immunities, and so we. Uh, uh, we should uh, to uh, work with international criminal court because it uh, has jurisdiction uh, for proceeding uh, uh, investigation for, um, according to uh, uh, sorry regard to some categories of people yeah and uh, so uh, for today we sent uh, um, 24 submission for International Criminal Court, and as a result, information from our submissions, uh, we see in the recording of, uh, of a prosecutor's office of International Criminal Court um, since uh, uh, 2016. In a recording of each year, uh, 2016, 2017, during for 2021, we see our information in these recordings. Uh, sorry, in these reports. <laughs> I'm sorry of my English. Uh, in these <laughs> reports. And so um, in the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, uh, of um, Zara, we, I think 20, we lost you. Um, say that they um, feel of, uh, Ukrainian. Do you hear me? Sorry. And um, 
uh, that they finish preparing an investigation of the situation in Ukraine. And so uh, uh, it uh, uh, was a result our um, joint work with non-government organization because it's a very unique experience for us. Uh, but for ICC, it was very uh, good materials because it uh, the first in their practice when government organization with non-government organization have a uh, joint position. And so we say that um, we uh, want to investigate these crimes, but we don't have this opportunity in each cases. So uh, we ask them to open the uh, full investigation uh, of situation in Ukraine. And so now it's question uh, is open because of, as you know, Ukraine uh, for today uh, don't ratify Rome statute. And so we have a draft of law of war crimes that Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine uh, supported but now it, uh, in the office of president and we are uh, waiting for the uh, sign of president of Ukraine this uh, law, this law, because it's important for our work also is about implementation of international humanitarian law and international criminal law in the national legislative of Ukraine. It's very important and maybe after this, um, after this, uh, our situation will be better in ICC. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's it's a, it's a very important matter, and uh, probably the ratification will um, give a lot of uh, strength to your mandate before the ICC. So it's highly important. So thank you very much for your answer. So we go to Stefan. Could you tell us a bit? As Barbara said, I don't think I'm a clairvoyant either. Um, but I mean, Luke's question pertains to the next two to five years. I honestly don't think that that is a question about whether or not and what humanitarians do in the next two to five years. I think more so, and here, sorry, Barbara, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm contradicting you slightly. I don't, don't think it's just between the two warring uh, sides. This is a geopolitical playing ground, and I believe the international community can make mistakes, and other way around, they can also maybe iron things out, hopefully. Um, and in that sense, I think that the OSC is very well placed, because it does have a, a huge, um, you know, uh, in in intake of different uh, uh, societies, cultures, and so on and so forth. Um, but whether or not and what the humanitarians do for the next two to five years really depends on what's going to happen on the ground. Um, of course, they shouldn't leave before there isn't a good reason to leave. But one, one thing that I believe is, um, I think, as I said earlier on, it's important that we, we start reducing staff because the presence, you know, leads to also misunderstandings on the ground by the civilian population and others. Um, the, the more people that you have, the more it looks like the international community actually gives the damn about what's happening. And the less humanitarians that you have, but the better programming you have. And here I, I, um, I comment on the work of um, um, UNDP's early re recovery um, uh, program. When they look at you know, how can we do programming that, that helps people, maybe if not finding jobs, but something meaningful to do? Um, and there are various programs. And nowadays, I think uh, humanitarian practitioners are very clear <clears throat> the, that assistance has so many faces nowadays. Uh, and that can make a change because it makes a change to the dignity of people. Uh, and in the end, that's what you want to uh, achieve. And it's not simply, um, you know, whether they have, a, you know, a parcel of rice, oil and a bit of sugar and stuff. Now, I'm not taking away that shouldn't happen, but I think the, the humanitarians should veer towards the transition phase where, depending on what happens, you're still there, your prepositions, should the conflict flare up, but you should also be ready to uh, start, you know, moving into a 
a different paradigm that of development rather than or you know um, uh, development I think rather than uh, than looking back all the time. So anyway, that's my my take on that. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I noticed that Stefan actually started to answer the questions from the chat. So please let me go back to that. And uh, please uh, let me ask a question that we have uh, in the chat to Zara. So the question is, uh, have you had any cases investigated, adjudicated that involved the members of the Ukrainian armed forces? It for me, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, we have, we have, of course, because it also our obligation to investigate this uh, type of crimes. Uh, maybe you uh, listened before about tornado, uh, for example, that uh, made um, uh, very, very uh, many tortures and another type of crimes. And so it's just one of example, but we, um, understand that it, very, uh, it is a very sensitive uh, question for Ukraine and for Ukrainian people and for society. And so we have different reaction of uh, investigation of this type of crimes. And it's uh, uh, very important for communication, these investigations and uh, for um, opening or, or, or not opening information about this investigation, because it's very, very sensitive. But of course, all cases uh, uh, that, uh, for example, we have uh, information from people, from victims of crimes, or for example, from open resource, yeah? Even uh, sometimes uh, we uh, find this information in reports of international organizations, for example, ON and uh, different other, and we check it. And if we don't have investigation of one of uh, cases that, uh, uh, that are in uh, open resources, uh, we open um, this investigation. Uh, it's uh, very important for us because uh, also for ICC, we show that uh, we uh, uh, investigate all crimes that we can. What about information we have in, uh, we uh, investigate also. We have some questions for um, about qualification of this type of crimes also. For example, in beginning of conflict, it was um, ordinary crimes, uh, uh, qualify uh, as a ordinary crimes because we really didn't have uh, uh, this experience and uh, I, I mean in international humanitarian and criminal law but uh, uh, since uh, tw um, 2017 2016 uh, we began to uh, qualify as uh, war crimes uh, with different qualification uh, according to um, article 438 of criminal court of ukraine it violation of um, of methods uh, of war, yeah. And so uh, now, uh, as I say before, a situation um, better, different better. And so all, all these facts, we try to investigate and open this criminal investigation. Maybe if I can add just a little bit to what was said, this, uh, for, for instance, a tornado case is a very important example. Every time we had a training with uh, Ukrainian militaries and we had hundreds of those, uh, someone would, would remember that. And it's something which actually works as a prevention mechanism, as a prevention tool as well. So the militaries know this might happen to them. They, and it's very important, especially for the commanders, uh, you always explain them that the responsibility of the commanders is much higher than the, just an ordinary soldiers. And it's that it's in their interest, try to make those this things not happening in their units, uh, to not get to that level. We always tell them that try to address minor violations because it's like a snowball. You uh, just neglect the minor violations, it leads to the bigger one, to the bigger one. And every time this discussion comes to the ICC, whether they can come there, for example, the crimes committed by Ukrainian uh, militaries can, can up, come up to ICC. But we always talk that, look, how ICC works. ICC usually steps up when there is clearly the local system is not capable to address many, many issues. If you start addressing it from the very bottom, 
from the commander of the unit. You see something is not going wrong. Stop it. Yes, you have a different tools to cooperate with the prosecutor office, with the uh, military police, which also exist to um, address their kind of minor issues, like, for example, drinking, yeah, and uh, getting into the fight with civilians or something like this. Uh, and uh, so it should be part of the system and it should be understood by everyone in army or in other security services in place that it's in their interest to not get to the tornado case. The tornado case, it's an extreme which could never had to happen. And uh, in terms of what, how Ukrainian system, as Zary um, just said, it was not prepared. It was not prepared for war. We had pretty very much Soviet type mentality in terms of international humanitarian law. Yeah, I remember how in Soviet times, everybody were trained just on IHL saying that if you need something like you need a food, you can take it from civilians. That would lim was limited to understanding of international humanitarian law. Then the war happened. Okay, so what, how we deal with that? And the system started to adjust slowly as all big systems, but since 2017, we can see how the Ministry of uh, Defense already issued a very big document explaining how international humanitarian law should be uh, implemented uh, uh, in its structure. And later on, you would get all kind of smaller decrees and the orders on, on the lower levels. It would start it finally to integrate into the uh, training programs, training program for officers in the uh, military schools, military universities. It takes forever. Uh, as all uh, educational, especially matter, uh, approaches, it takes very long time, uh, especially to, 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 to change something which was not prepared for that. Uh, and uh, we can see that Ukrainian, Ukraine moved, for example, on uh, adopting um, safe school declaration. I mentioned in, uh, in my initial statement uh, the issue of uh, attacks on schools and over 700 schools been uh, targeted on the front line. Um, many schools for several, several times. Uh, two years ago, almost two years ago already, uh, or am I wrong? A year ago, Ukraine uh, adopted safe school declaration. So at least this making this commitment. And we know that even if one side starts to improve its behavior and commits to something, it usually affects the behavior of, a, of another side. So I think it is a very, very important uh, work prosecutor office does moving forward with the cases on the Ukrainian side as well, because it shows uh, people living on the ground that the government is here to protect them that all, all this happening just to help them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zara and Barbara for this comment. It, uh, this is very interesting. And yes, of course, no one expects war and no one would prepare its legal system to deal with the war crimes, crimes against humanity, just in case the war could happen. So of course, this is learning by experience. And, uh, but nevertheless, this is, uh, very good to hear that the Ukrainian system is getting more and more prepared to deal with these crimes and uh, you're getting uh, a lot of expertise in that so you can really bring to the justice those who are responsible for the crimes. Uh, so another question from the chat uh, was actually asked to everyone. Um, yesterday the Kyiv post closed. What are your thoughts on its closing? What message does it send? Uh, the QF post being the one of the most factual, neutral, and influential English language news outlet in Ukraine. So, does anyone of you, do any one of you have any thoughts on that? Okay. Well, not really prepared to talk about the uh, freedom of speech in Ukraine, except for general statements that yeah, freedom of speech should be respected, including by um, private actors. If you have a business owning the, uh, the newspaper, there were, I know that there were concerns before when the a newspaper changed its owner on how it can go. And we've seen these problems before when you would have an oligarch-owned media that you would 
have uh, cases of censorship there or change of leadership in the in the media if the owner is not happy with the editorial policy. I'm not prepared to to say what exactly happened now in the Kiev Post, but it's a general statement. If what I just described happened, it's not good, and it's something which brings us back to the not such a good times. Which we Absolutely. Before in Ukraine, yeah. Ab Absolutely. Thank you. So we have another question to Zara. Um, since he mentioned that access to occupied territories is limited, how does your office get enough evidence to prove the guilt beyond reasonable doubt in criminal cases? Uh, this uh, takes me to the question of the hybrid conflict. This is uh, what our mm, uh, uh, one of the, our uh, uh, viewers writes: fake news, disinformation, multiple truths where we know from our research in this project that uh, on the Russian side, there are clear allegations or fake, or fake trials with forged evidence and allegedly also invented defendants. I understand. Uh, 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 right for truth, uh, as uh, our work of war crimes, it's the uh, elements of the transitional justice. And it's very uh, good as for me that um, we are not only one body, government body, that work in this sphere. Because we have uh, com competence yeah, uh, in the investigation of war crimes. But also we cooperate in another body governments in different uh, um, spheres for also, I agree also that it's a hybrid war and it's a new type of war in, and it's um, not simple, I think, uh, even for international community because uh, before in wars, it's uh, more understandable uh, uh, the site of uh, conflicts, uh, the instruments of war and so on and so on. So for us, uh, if it um, about our uh, work, it uh, about our function, so we can do different, uh, can make a different message that, for example, demonstrate that uh, this fake news, for example, or uh, some, uh, but uh, now um, we have the new, I know, uh, the new body, the center of disinformation, as you know, uh, and so we are open to cooperate this, uh, we, we, with this body. So we even uh, write, um, even write a letter for them uh, if they need our help. For example, we uh, ready to help them. But in uh, each cases of this disinformation, we can't uh, do it because we have every day fake news about uh, Ukrainian army, Ukrainian uh, persecutors office that uh, we are, for example, we don't investigate uh, uh, crimes uh, that uh, uh, may be committed uh, Ukrainian sites, soldiers and another Naba, or for example, that we are um, proceeding, uh, for example, political proceeding or something else. In this case, we can say something that uh, um, uh, that to uh, fight with this uh, disinformation. But in general, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not our function. Uh, but for, for us, very important, uh, we've, we work with a non-government organization uh, in uh, building our communication uh, strategy. Uh, in these conditions, since this in, um, conditions of hybrid war, how to communicate our uh, main message yeah, about investigate crimes, about um, work with our army and soldiers in uh, spheres of international humanitarian law. We also support the trainings of our uh, army of our soldiers and our investigators also because they after us, after prosecutor office start to uh, qualify uh, this type of crimes as war. crimes not a question but it not question only um, 
uh, gentlemen bodies in conditions of ar armed conflict. You know, strategy uh, state um, strategy of uh, state poli uh, state policy, yeah, state policy in in conditions of armed conflict, and that uh, this strategy should include also the communication questions, questions of communicate with people in Ukraine and with people in occupied territories. It's uh, very, very important to give them message that they are not our uh, enemies, yeah? That it's Ukrainian citizens that can be also victims of crimes and we investigate uh, crimes against these people also. And it's really so. So it uh, we do something, but it, it uh, should be uh, it should be more. It should be more from state also. I think. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for this answer. Uh, so the very last question that we have in the chat goes to Barbara. So um, could you please briefly answer it? Um, have you tried to engage the uh, Donetsk or Luhansk uh, People's Republic representatives in a dialogue about IHL and especially the responsibility topics? If yes, what was the reaction? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, which is uh, a bit sensitive. I will talk in my private capacity and not representing an organization here. Um, yes, I have a, quite an experience of uh, having a dialogue with a representative of DNR and LNR uh, on various topics, humanitarian topics, um, including um, international humanitarian law. Uh, it's, it was not an easy dialogue, let's say, put it this way. Um, there were ways, and when I was uh, working on the topic, there was a ways to engage uh, fighters on the DNR and LNR side, uh, including, and what we did use, we used um, different technical tools for that. For instance, um, mobile application, uh, which uh, is sort of a gay quiz game for fighters, where they can, while playing, uh, learn about the rules of uh, IHL, and the rules of war. Um, we found it quite good working in this place where almost everyone has an access to internet and has a telephone. And especially for soldiers who are very bored sitting in the checkpoints or in their trenches, and instead of and always play something. Um, so then once we launched uh, the game uh, the promotion, we got uh, thousands of downloads, uh, including the non-government controlled territories. Uh, there was a way to have a kind of low profile uh, dialogue and engagement with fighters, uh, but it's never been in a scale we had on the uh, government control territory. Uh, so I will probably stop here. <laughs> okay, thank you. But yes, so it's it's in general, it's all quite challenging to engage uh, non-state groups. Uh, very often they, because they don't feel and don't understand that they are bound by international humanitarian law. Consider it they are not states, they never signed any treaty, international treaty, that and uh, believe that it's not applied to them, which is not true. And international humanitarian law, maybe in not all of its scope, but still applies to the non-state groups as well. And they can be responsible for violating it. And they have not only, um, responsibility and, and the obligations under IHL, including positive obligations. And it's a topic which is not easy to discuss, not only with a non-state group, but with the government, especially with a parental government, when we have a case of uh, separatist movements. Because once you start to talk about positive obligations with, for the uh, non-governmental groups, government uh, always gets quite defensive because it's already you step in the territory which can be considered as uh, well maybe not recognition of those groups 
but acknowledging uh, their existence and their ability to fulfill so certain positive, uh, positive obligations. So it's, it's a very tricky thing to do from all sides, including the reaction of international community, considering that those groups in certain, in many countries are under sanctions or in the terrorist list. So that's why I don't want to go into many details on this. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I think we are done with the questions and uh, Rastislav, I will pass the floor to you then. Thank you very much, Agata, for moderating the Q&A and thank you, Barbara, Zera and Stefan for being here with us and thank you to everyone who has joined. Um, so this concludes uh, the third webinar in the series. In the next webinar, we'll be talking about investigation and uh, prosecution of a very specific crime that happened uh, during the conflict and that's downing of the MH17 flight. Uh, so we'll discuss also legal proceedings that are open relating to, to that. So thank you very much again to everyone involved in this talk. Uh, and I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.